station identification. You're listening to Z-Talk Radio Network. Operating frequency on ztalkradio.com. We give those other guys the finger. You're listening to Z-Talk Radio Network. Engage your brain and enter the Mind's Eye Show. I'm your host, Brian Turnov, and you're listening to Z Talk Radio. Joining us on this enlightening edition of the Mind's Eye is medical doctor Rick Strassman, a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, as well as president and co-founder of the Cottonwood Research Foundation. From 1990 to 1995, he performed the first new human studies with psychedelic drugs in the United States in more than two decades, focusing on the powerful, naturally occurring compound dimethyltryptamine, or simply known as DMT. Rick published his findings in DMT, the spirit molecule, and a document, excuse me, a documentary of the same name. After completing this groundbreaking research, he was left with one fundamental question. What does it mean that DMT, a simple chemical naturally found in all of our bodies, instantaneously opens us to an interactive spirit world that feels more real than our own world? When his decades of clinical psychiatric research and Buddhist practice were unable to provide answers to this question, Strassman began searching for a more resonant spiritual model. He found that the visions of the Hebrew prophets were strikingly similar to those of the volunteers in his DMT studies. In his brand new book, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, A New Science of Spiritual Revelation in the Hebrew Bible, Strassman reveals his new model called Theo Neurology. In just a few short minutes, find out how Theo Neurology bridges biology and spirituality by proposing that the divine communicates with us by the brain. How does this happen? Is there really a God trying to communicate with us through DMT? If so, what are the messages? All this and more with Dr. Rick Strassman after this quick commercial break. <laughs> We're back on the Mind's Eye with Dr. Rick Strassman, medical doctor and clinical associate professor of psychiatry. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for an enlightening conversation, Rick. Well, thanks, Brian, for having me on your show. Uh, the pleasure really is all mine, and in preparation for the interview, and of course in the spirit of scientific pursuit, not only did I watch your documentary, uh, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and of course read your new book, I decided to break out my old Torah uh, for my bar mitzvah and take some of uh, some hits of DMT. Uh, of course, I'm just kidding about the last aspect of it, but you seem to be a proponent of use of mind-altering substances, obviously for the appropriate studies. How did you initially get turned on to DMT for scientific use? Well, I found out about DMT somewhat uh, far along in my overarching interest, which 
had begun during my undergraduate years, um, and that interest was a curiosity regarding the the, um, the biology of spiritual experience, and that curiosity grew out of what seemed to be striking similarities between the descriptions of people taking psychedelic drugs and those that resulted from certain forms of Eastern religious meditation practices, both of which were becoming increasingly popular around the time I was an undergraduate in the late 60s and early 1970s. Um, and uh, I didn't know about DMT at the time, but I was interested in the pineal gland as a possible source of maybe a chemical or a brain functional activity which might be triggered both as a result of meditation and as a result of ingesting the psychedelic drugs, at least to the extent that the two states resembled each other. Um, so I went to, um, I, um, you know, underwent a lot of training. Uh, I completed my undergraduate work and um, it seemed to me if I wanted to study the biology of spiritual states, I would need to become a physician and then a psychiatrist. So I went through all of that uh, you know, requisite uh, training. And uh, then my first independent study was to look at the role of melatonin in psychophysiology or um, uh, you know, psychobiology in humans. Um, and this study took place in the early 1980s before we knew much about melatonin. Uh, it actually turned out um, that melatonin was not especially psychoactive. And so hmm. by that time I had learned about DMT and I decided to embark on a study of that compound instead. And, and that's pretty much, that, that work becomes the prelude to the book that we're going to be talking about tonight and the research there. So let's let's go into that work from the 90s a little bit because it's you can't really talk about this new book without talking about that research beforehand. Uh, well, that's right. Um, yeah, um, so I got interested in DMT because it is a known psychedelic substance that the body makes. This was called an and this was called an and an and hallucinogen hallucinogen or, or um, psychedelic. Mm -hmm. um, it's also ubiquitous in the plant kingdom. Uh, it occurs in uh, you know hundreds, if not thousands, of plants, especially those which uh, are used for mind altering or you know for mind altering properties from Latin America. Um, it was discovered in those plants in the late 1940s and then was discovered to be uh, quite uh, mind-altering, uh, you know, psychedelic, in uh, the 1950s. And then maybe within the next 10 years or so, uh, the presence of DMT was determined uh, in both lower animals, uh, such as rats and rabbits, as well as in the human being. Um, so it was the first uh, established naturally occurring psychedelic in the human body. Um, it uh, w was studied in psychiatric circles uh, pretty intensively, nowhere uh, as popular as LSD. Um, and it was mostly looked at for its potential role in abnormal mental states, especially psychosis or schizophrenia. Um, it was given to quite a few human research volunteers, um, and it also attained, uh, you know, some uh, minor popularity um, in the street, you know, recreational uh -huh. use. Um, of course. <laughs> but again, never as popular as um, as drugs like LSD or psilocybin. And why did you, at the time, doing that type of research w would be considered pretty controversial? Uh, weren't, weren't you afraid of the criticism or even some form of professional backlash that, that you'd receive from, from doing such controversial work? 
Um, well, I was, and, uh, you know, I had a couple of things going for me in that regard. I, um, I had already established myself as an independent researcher um, in a less controversial, uh, in, in a less, uh, in a less, in a, in a less uh, uh, controversial field. Um, mm-hmm. The approach that I took with my pineal melatonin work was um, a you know, pharmacology, endocrinology, circadian rhythm kind of approach. Um, I didn't speak or um, I didn't uh, include any of my ideas about the biology of spirituality in that study. Um, and I also framed my um, I also framed my DMT um, project in the most non-controversial um, you know, contexts that I could. Um, it was a uh, strictly um, you know, psychopharmacological kind of study. Uh, I was interested in what's called a uh, in a well in what's called a you know dose response study. Um, I would give a number of different uh, doses of the drug and characterize the biological and psychological responses as exhaustively as I could. Um, I uh, spoke about the importance of this work um, also from points of view that um, were not especially uh, or especially arguable. Um, in other words, uh, I was uh, interested in confirming uh, you know, some of the pharmacological studies that had occurred in lower, in, in lower animals over the intervening 20 years, uh, uh, you know, since the time these drugs um, were made so difficult to study in humans. Um, and I also approached it from the point of view of, you know, drug abuse. Um, in other words, uh, you know, people continued, uh, you know, to use the psychedelics and we didn't really understand what they did. And, you know, DMT is kind of a, you know, prototypical psychedelic drug. Um, and also I unearthed, you know, the biology of schizophrenia uh, studies as well and pointed out, you know, that, you know, to the extent um, um, that DMT could be playing a uh, you know, possible, you know, role in um, uh, 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 a mental illness, it was important to understand its effects in pharmacology. Yeah, you had to be, it seemed like you had to be extremely careful about the vocabulary that you used and well and kind of geared towards some type of purpose uh, to service humanity or uh, in some type of respect or society. And like all great research experiments and the conclusions that you find always will lead to more questions. And after DMT, the, the soul molecule, you quite convincingly say that you were left with one fundamental question, which then became essentially the premise of this new book. So let's let's get into that. Uh, DMT in the, in the Soul of Prophecy. Give the basic premise. Um, well, uh, so there were a couple of, of you know, findings uh, of the original study, the DMT study, which took place in the early 90s, 1990 to 1995, which were unexpected. Um, I expected uh, a specific, you know, kind of experience, um, and the type of experience that I was expecting was influenced by my years of um, of, um, of Zen Buddhist uh, study and training, and uh, so that experience I was expecting as the peak effect of DMT was the Buddhist enlightenment experience, which is known for its being content-free, no images, no words, um, you know, the dissolving of the personal uh, you know, sense of self, you know, merging the identity. with uh, the ground of all being, so to speak. <clears throat> and uh, so those kinds of experiences were extraordinarily uncommon uh, in my volunteers. Uh, uh, instead, um, the volunteers entered into a um, into a, a world of light. Uh, you know, their consciousness you know, seemed to have left their bodies, 
and their consciousness, you know, then perceived being in a world of light, uh, multicolored, rapidly moving, intensely colored and saturated. And um, it was a uh, extremely busy, content-free world. Um, it was inhabited um, by what seemed to be intelligent, uh, you know, sentient, uh, you know, conscious um, kinds of beings. Um, with whom the volunteers interacted. Uh, they spoke to the volunteers, the volunteers spoke to them. Um, they asked questions, gave answers, you know, things were done to the volunteers, you know, things were done to the beings. Um, and uh, with respect, you know, to the, the typical enlightenment-like experience that may have occurred in one person out of nearly 60. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, so the other, uh, you know, puzzling or confusing, uh, you know, finding uh, w which emerged from the study um, is the incredible and un and unshakable, you know, sense um, of of reality um, that the uh, you know that the volunteers um, applied or uh, attributed um, to the experience. Um, well, so there were, ex uh, you know, so there were quite clear um, about their experience uh, you know being uh, you know different than a dream or a vision uh, or other kinds of you know psychedelic you know drug experiences um, or a uh, you know hallucination um, so they described the encounter w with that world as being on as real or even more real than everyday reality and all three of the models that I had brought to bear mm -hmm. on my study proposed that the experiences or or um, or the apprehension of that state um, were brain generated as opposed to you know um, a, a, you know consciousness perceived. Um, in other words, uh, on the model of uh, well, um, so the psychopharmacology model, you know, proposed that um, uh, well that the brain uh, almost generating these experiences, uh, as opposed you know, um, as opposed uh, to uh, allowing um, of the volunteers, um, you know, to perceive them anew, um, and you know the psychoanalytic model. Uh, also proposed, uh, um, you know, that the visions were a result of unconscious conflicts or unconscious impulses. And uh, the Buddhist one also proposed, you know, that the states of mind um, were kind of peripheral or kind of detritus mm -hmm. on, the, um, on, uh, on the mind's, you know, way to a, you know, formless enlightened state, uh, which was the goal. Um, so at a certain point, I had, you know, to suspend, uh, you know, my judgment uh, and start, you know, to um, at least um, um, I'm on the surface of it, uh, start uh, to accept um, the you know, belief of the volunteers, uh, you know, that, well, that they were actually entering into a externally objective, freestanding kind of reality. Um, and I was thinking I would just be able to, uh, you know, start to you know, look at other models, if, you know, for how that could, uh, you know, be taking place after I completed my work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I suppose also at around the same time, uh, you know, the realization started, you know, to dawn upon me that if these states or if, you know, the worlds um, that the volunteers um, we're entering were real, uh, uh, you know, that is, uh, uh, you know, what people call um, spiritual states or spiritual worlds. Um, you know, so I kind of put that idea on the back burner um, as I, you know, began to, you know, look around for other scientific ways uh, to explain what the volunteers uh, had gone through. And, and this pursuit for yourself not only was it a scientific pursuit, but then it also became a personal and religious one for you as well. And I know as a, a scientist, uh, you know, a doctor, you're supposed to say objective and 
I want to say almost aloof to the experiment and the research, but I imagine you must have had a lot of emotions coming to the surface while searching for this question to, to you know, what, what does it mean about DMT? You know, you're almost like you made a, a religious 360 in a sense. Well, kind of. Uh, well, that process, uh, you know, began, um, I mean, even, you know, during the study of itself, um, uh, because if I approach the volunteers' reports with any skepticism or any uh, or any stance which interpreted what they had gone through as you know something other you know than what they had just gone through, um, I was losing a lot of the interesting material that they were starting to keep to themselves. Uh, you know, so I kind of uh, in you know some ways had to. Uh, um, I, I, I in, well, um, so um, like at that point I. Uh, you know, needed uh, to, um, I guess, uh, you know, begin to you know, make that 360. I suppose uh, um, I, you know, made a 90 degree turn at that point. Um, and you know, so after the study was over, um, I started to explore some of the current ideas about parallel matter, or I mean, parallel universes and dark, uh, you know, matter. Um, you know, which are you know scientific explanations you know, for ongoing uh, you know parallel levels um, of reality, uh, externally objective freestanding, um, you know, which can be perceived in uh, you know um, in uh, specific circumstances, you know, using specialized equipment, um, and I'm even uh, uh, you know looking uh, at those. I, uh, um, ideas, you know, and I'm um, on um, those models. I still, uh, you know, didn't, you know, feel, uh, you know, qu uh, you know, quite satisfied um, 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 with their explanatory power. Um, even though, uh, you know, they could provide, you know, mechanistic explanations, um, you know, they still, uh, you know, didn't. Uh, um, you know, uh, um, concern themselves with two specific questions, uh, um, and one question was, you know, how things got to be that way in the first place, mm -hmm. and uh, the other question is, um, is um, are people any smarter or any wiser, any more compassionate as a result of entering into those states? And um, I suppose um, if those states were dark matter or, or, you know, parallel universes, I suppose it's possible, you know, to understand or, you know, to develop, you know, some kind of new engine for interstellar space travel. Interesting. But still, uh, you know, would that make us, you know, kinder or pay more uh, or, or, you know, pay uh, you know, more um, attention to each other, you know, be more, more generous? Uh, 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 you know, those kind of, of you know, of, um, of ethical and, you know, moral questions. Um, you know, so I, you know, I, su I suppose that I, you know, turned another 90 degrees <laughs> and, you know, decided to start looking into other systems of thought, which also are interested in, uh, uh, you know, normally in um, invisible worlds, um, which are the religious, uh, you know, traditions. And, and, um, one of the advantages of the religious, uh, um, uh, well, of um, uh, well, of uh, the religious, you know, systems, is you know they're also um, uh, uh, spending a lot of time uh, extracting uh, ethical and you know moral and and uh, and uh, um, and you know, theological. Uh, um, you know, content, uh, uh, you know, from those states, mm -hmm. um, and I, um, <clears throat> and well, well, so from the outset, I, I um, had, you know, to dispense, uh, uh, you know, with a Buddhist model, uh, you know, for the reasons that I already stated. In other words, the experiences um, of the volunteers weren't compatible, uh, you know, with the goal of, of you know, Buddhist practice. Um, and and also, you know, Buddhism's uh, stance, you know, that these states are are 
uh, you know, are you know primarily uh, you know, uh, you know mental, um, uh, I guess what they would call you know static, uh, you know weren't uh, you know consistent um, with the experiences of my volunteers, um, and another popular approach to um, understanding and interpreting the spiritual properties of uh, of of these drugs, which is becoming increasingly uh, you know, popular is you know shamanism, especially from Latin America. Right. You know, but there are quite a few ethical and you know moral problems with that you know tradition. It's um, it's also a you know foreign import, as it were. It isn't quite you know resonant you know with the majority of you know the Western you know mind out there. Um, and also, um, you know, there isn't any you know recognizable god or you know single deity. In Latin American shamanism, and you know, that would also be a you know, problem if it was going to be a you know widely applicable you know model for uh, understanding my volunteers' experiences. Uh, you know, so um, I uh, decided to uh, I well um, so I decided to go back to the drawing board and <laughs> uh, you know turn to the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> and I imagine coming back to it after all those years that. Uh, must have opened your eyes, and I and I know it. You you said in the book that it, it turned you off or, uh, originally. And how has your opinion changed about it since then uh, in relationship to your work? Obviously, you you feel like it's a an important source or a resource when it comes to analyzing DM the the state of DMT. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I just you know. Um, um, uh, um, well, so I just began, you know, skimming the Bible, you know, kind of looking, uh, you know, for interesting, you know, tidbits, as it were, um, you know, at, at the same time, even skimming it uh, made clear to me, you know, that I was going, you know, to need some guides to understanding the text. Right, because it's a, it is a very difficult text to, to interpret. Or, or it's an extremely difficult, you know, text uh, to crack. Yeah, and you know, I had gone through a, a you know relatively traditional conservative Jewish upbringing and schooling. Um, you know, when I was a you know, public school student, um, and you know, we looked at the Bible some, the, the Torah, you know, but you know, mostly it was historical and cultural. You know, not especially spiritual. You know, um, we didn't you know, discuss, uh, you know, God's, uh, uh, you know, uh, his characteristics, his qualities, his nature. Um, you know, we did, you know, look at his uh, special interest in the Jews and in Israel, you know, um, you know, but the more abstract, you know, theological, um, you know, kinds of discussions, which I was interested in thinking about as an adult, you know, returning to the text, weren't, you know, necessarily, you know, part of my childhood, uh, uh, you know, training. Um, so I, um, you know, quickly turned, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to the medieval Jewish, you know, philosophers and and uh, commentators in order to get some understanding of what, uh, of of uh, you know, what the text was actually saying. I mean, if you open up the first, you know, book of Genesis, the first, uh, you know, chapter, uh, and and the first verse. Um, you know, it's it's um, it is enough to stop you in your tracks. You know, in the hmm. beginning, God created uh, uh, the heaven and the earth. Uh, I mean, what exactly does that mean? Hmm. Uh, um, well, the beginning of what? Um, and you know, what is God? And you know, what is God doing? Uh, you know, creating. And you know, is it strictly speaking the heavens and of the earth? And you know, what did He? Uh, 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 what you know, create them from? Uh, you know, so um, I, you know, began, you know, uh, to read um, on the classical, you know, commentaries, uh, Ibn Ezra and Rashi, Maimonides, Nachmanides, Spinoza, even. Um, and uh, as I was doing this, it was easier to enter into the text. And uh, the more time I spent with the text, um, I began to you know, come up with an idea of the prophetic state of consciousness, um, which is quite like DMT, 
uh, in a number of respects. And, you know, and it's also, you know, uh, unlike DMT in a number of respects. Um, you know, so that was kind of the beginning of my, uh, you know, thinking um, about the Bible as a key to understanding the DMT experience. And for the majority and the rest of the show, we're going we're gonna to talk about the, the similarities and differences and your findings that, that make up the new model, which we're going to talk about. Uh, and prophetic messages, uh, they seem to be very intoxicating. It seems like humans have, have always had an, an obsession with the future and, and people who supposedly can predict it. Uh, define some of the, the characteristics that, that make up a prophet in, in your eyes and prophecy and how it relates to your hypothesis. Um, well, you know, uh, so, well, so my definition of the prophetic state and a prophecy is, is a much you know, broader one you know, than is uh, in common use. Most people think of the phenomenon as foretelling or predicting, um, you know, but that's, you know, kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of an, well, that's kind of a you know, side effect of the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Uh, the first translation of Hebrew, uh, I mean, of the Hebrew Bible uh, into another language was into the Greek. And the Greeks uh, were quite, you know, keen on spiritual experience as a means of foretelling the future. It was what they called, you know, divination. Um, and uh, and uh, so the Greeks uh, translated um, the Hebrew, uh, you know, word uh, uh, for prophet, which is Navi, N-A-V-I, into the Greek word prophetes, which means, you know, to tell the future um, or, you know, to predict what's going to happen. Uh, you know, so in a way, it's a good example of how every translation is an interpretation, you know, because if you look at the translation of the Hebrew word Navi, it means to interpret or to communicate or to transmit information, those kinds of things. Uh, and, you know, uh, the notion of predicting um, or foretelling doesn't play any part in, uh, in uh, the definition. Uh, you know, so if you approach the concept from a broader point of view, um, I define the prophetic experience that any encounter with uh, with uh, spiritual things, either visions or voices, inspiration, flying through the air, out of body experiences, uh, and you know, foretelling the future, uh, you know, truthful dreams, you know, those kinds of things. You know, if, um, if you expand the, you know, if you do expand the definition of prophecy in uh, in the way that I'm suggesting, um, you can. Uh, you know, quickly see that quite a few of the prophets, even though they predicted, you know, the predictions either never came true or were wrong or, you know, never you know, came about. And, uh, you know, there were other, uh, you know, people um, who could predict, you know, who weren't, uh, uh, um, who weren't, you know, necessarily uh, what the text refers to as, as a true prophet. And, you know, there's other, uh, you know, um, and, and, well, so there are other ways, uh, you know, to foretell, uh, you know, the future as well. You know, like, uh, well, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, for example, uh, well, the weatherman uh, is, uh, um, is more accurate than not. And, uh, uh, you know, so that certainly isn't occurring, you know, through a, uh, you know, prophetic process. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, so... Uh, Yes. Uh, so go ahead. Oh no, no, no. I was, I was saying, yeah, that you're. You, that, that's a funny way of of looking at it. Uh, and uh, so, your methodology for comparing the the DMT and the prophetic state was that essentially doing a side by side analysis of your work from with the DMT volunteers along with the Hebrew Bible, and then just more of like a qualitative study in a sense. Yeah, you know, so um, when I, uh, you know, characterized the DMT response, um, I used a, you know, Buddhist model in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, broke the experience, you know, down into a number of, you know, manageable categories. 
uh, in those categories included, you know, such, uh, uh, you know, things as, you know, perceptual effects, um, like effects on vision or experiencing vision or, or you know, um, or, uh, or, you know, seeing visions, uh, hearing things, um, and, you know, physical effects, um, like feeling hot or cold, light or heavy. Um, also, I included emotional effects, like feeling happy, sad, frightened, those kinds of things. Um, and also, you know, cognitive effects, either uh, alterations in your thought processes or thought content. And, you know, finally, I included a category which I call volition or, uh, you know, uh, well, so that concerned one's will, uh, you know, being able to interact with things um, in a, you know, willful manner, so to speak. Um, you know, so... Uh, what I did is to compare the descriptions of the prophetic figures using, uh, uh, you know, those categories. Right. Um, and, uh, well, um, well, was, uh, well, so for example, if you look at Ezekiel's, you know, vision in the first chapter of his book, uh, you know, there are quite a few perceptual effects, you know, visual ones, flashing lights, uh, flaming fire, lightning bolts, uh, there's wings and there's eyes. <clears throat> there's spheres and there's balls and there's colors um, and there's beings uh, you know composed of animal human bird uh, those kinds of uh, components um, also you know there's a lot of descriptions of his anxiety his fear his you know physical weakness um, he's uh, you know feeling uh, you know kind of shaky and uh he also is under the complete control of the visions and uh, one of the beings ends up speaking to him in a extremely commanding kind of manner um, and you know so all of those are extreme are, are, are you know quite characteristic of the DMT effect uh, you know so you know it's interesting I was kind of you know percolating this idea uh, you know for a long time but it was only just a, a uh, a few years ago, that I actually, you know, uh, you know, took the plunge and and uh, um, and you know began uh, 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 <clears throat> um, we well, comparing side by side the two uh, states of consciousness, and uh, I was quite relieved, uh, you know, to be honest, you know, when uh, they lined up as you know closely as they did. Yeah, but the striking thing, though is even though, you know, the experiences themselves are extremely similar, you know, the visions and the voices and the emotions, um, you know, there was another, you know, quality, you know, both to the DMT effect and the prophetic state, you know, which had kind of slipped my mind or um, had eluded me when I was doing my DMT study and analyzing the results. And, you know, that was a category that I ended up calling relatedness. You know, the quality, the nature, um, you know, the quantity of interactions between the experience and the contents of the visions. Um, in other words, uh, the, uh, well, the kind of communication, um, you know, the emotional bond, uh, you know, the language is used, um, is, in, um, is, any of the, the, is, is, you know, the communication visual or auditory, is it physical? Uh, you know, so that, you know, was an aspect of, of the DMT experience that I had escaped me at the time and it became clear as I was looking at the prophetic experiences you know because of the extremely highly articulated nature of you know the relationship you know between the prophetic figure and the beings uh, you know that they encounter um, so that uh, you know then you know led me to start uh, you know looking at uh, the message uh, contained in both states you know because uh, you know the uh, um, well, the main, you know, function um, of the relationship in either of the states is uh, is um, is the communication of information. And um, when I started to, you know, to look um, I'm at the I'm at the content, you know, the message content, you know, the informational content of the two states, I uh, was, you know, forced, um, you know, to change my default position. And I then started using, uh, you know, categories that I extracted, you know, from the Bible as, uh, you know, the categories for categorizing, uh, well, the information content. 
Um, and you know, so that's uh, and well, so those categories included, uh, I well, uh, in, in included uh, well such uh, well <clears throat> um, included such you know things as you know moral and ethical uh, you know content uh, you know theological um, information you know concerning God's nature and activities. Um, well, uh, economic ideas, legal ideas, you know, philosophical ideas, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, and, and um, you know, using um, the Bible um, as, uh, you know, the default, and, and you know, then comparing, uh, you know, the message um, of uh, the DMT encounters, it was quite clear that the message of the prophetic state was quite a bit, you know, more highly articulated and you know, obviously, you more influential, uh, you know, than the DMT or even uh, you know the over, or even the overall you know psychedelic you know drug experience. And, and a major difference, you just it seemed like in the book that you said that there really was a lack of conversation about ethical guidelines and morality with the DMT volunteers in comparison to the prophetic and the professorial messages. Uh, do you think this indicates something about? the human experience in itself or that ethics is really a man-made concept or, or, or not at all? Uh, um, well, I spend uh, a fair amount of time, uh, you know, towards the second half of the book, you know, describing, you know, some mechanisms, uh, you know, which would take into account, you know, both, you know, the similarities between the two states um, as well as other uh, differences. And uh, I think, you know, ultimately I conclude, you know, that the difference is, you know, that the prophetic state uh, is an emanation from God. It's kind of an overflowing, you know, downward from God. And, uh, you know, ultimately you can take any, you know, drug you want uh, or, you know, um, as a result of spiritual, you know, practices, starvation or, or you know, fasting or prayer, um, you know, sensory deprivation, you could, uh, you know, possibly increase the amounts of DMT occurring naturally in your body, you know, but still, you know, those, you know, uh, you know well, <clears throat> um, so those, you know, kinds of, you know, mechanisms only, you know, go so, uh, uh, you know, go so far um, as explaining how, uh, you know, the contents come about, uh, you know, like a mechanism of, you know, the action uh, of the appearance of the visions, you know, how the brain, uh, you know, generates those visions, you know, but ultimately, um, you know, if it's going, uh, if it's going, uh, you know, to be a prophetic experience, a you know, truly spiritual experience, it, you know, needs to, you know, come from God and uh, the information content, you know, which is represented in the visions uh, comes from God and, you know, the interpretation uh, also needs to be divine. Um, at the same time, um, well, the commentators or the or you know the medieval Jewish you know philosophers speak about this notion of being qualified for prophecy, and you know the two areas of your mind that you need you know to you know perfect as you know best as you can are number one the imagination, and you know that's the location of the visions, and also number two. Is um is your intellect? Um, in in other words, you have to be educated. Um, you have to understand, uh, you know, certain specific notions of Judaism or of the Bible about God. Um, um about living a, 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 a you know moral life. Um, also you have to understand, you know, biology, you know, physiology. You have to understand, uh, you know, philosophy and you know language. Um, you know, politics, mathematics, you know, philology, grammar. Uh, you know, so you have to be an extremely qualified person, you know, to, um, you know, to be qualified, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, to receive, uh, um, uh, ins uh, well, uh, to receive prophetic inspiration. Um, you know, so it you know, seemed to me in in, in the case of uh, the volunteers, uh, you know, the, the DMT was stimulating. You know their imagination, but it, uh, but at uh, at uh, the same time, it didn't you know seem to be um, exerting uh, you know much of an effect 
um, on their intellect or on other rational minds. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, you said before that one of the biggest differences uh, between the two states' minds is that the biblical prophets' experiences were more highly articulated, they were profound and, and meaningful based on, on its influence. And I would agree with that for the most part, but at the same time, you also observed that, and which I thought was extremely important in your findings, was the clear-headedness of the DMT volunteers and that they were completely cognizant. And to me, this says, wouldn't, wouldn't that be more easier to validate or to be believe, to be believed because they are a primary source as opposed to the biblical prophets where you're just not just, but you know what I mean, by when you're you're reading something and you weren't there at the time. So wouldn't that almost be, to me, seems a bit more profound because they're primary, they're here, they're tangible right now. Right, right, yeah. Um, well, so that's true, and, you know, that's an insurmountable, you know, problem, uh, you know, because they don't have, you know, the primary source to this. Like I, uh, well, you know, the volunteers, um, like I was interviewing them all, um, and, you know, in the case of the prophetic, you know, figures, uh, you know, they lived a long, long, long time ago. Um, and, and, and even the rabbis, uh, you know, who redacted the Bible into its current, you know, form. Right. Um, I would imagine, you know, they did the redaction in an inspired, you know, semi-prophetic state. Hmm. Um, but still, um, you know, they lived, you know, 2,000 years ago, you know, 2,500 years ago as well. Or you know, a thousand years ago, you know, fifteen hundred years ago, yeah. You know, but you kind of you know have got to work you know with the material that you have. Uh, you know, a lot of religions you know which are you know based on old texts, um, and uh, you know, so to the extent that uh, you know that they do reflect uh, you know, the mind um, of the founders and you know the original uh, you know disciples, um, that's all you can do. Of course, of course, and let, let's talk about theo neurology. Of course, we're, we've been talking about it the whole time. But uh, explain explain your model and the conclusions that you found. Yeah, I was I was well, so the contemporary you know model for the biology of spiritual experience is one. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't say anything. No, no, no. Keep going. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, um, I just got some feedback. No, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the contemporary model for understanding. <clears throat> Uh, the biology of spiritual experience is what is called uh, it's, it's called um, neurotheology, um, and uh, it you know proposes uh, you know that the brain responds to you know, certain stimuli, um, which uh, you know could be meditation or prayer, uh, you know fasting, uh, you know sensory you know deprivation, um, pain, those kinds of things. And as a result of any number of the stimuli, uh, the brain responds uh, in a specific way. And it's only after the fact um, that somebody interprets, uh, you know, the experience as what they call spiritual. Um, and, and, you know, so that's what I call the bottom-up kind of model. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and um, well, so my new model is, is uh, what might be called a you know, top-down model. And I refer to it as um, you know, theo neurology. Um, in other words, you know, uh, the brain is configured by God in order to provide communication, you know, from God, uh, you know, to humans, um, as opposed, you know, to uh, you know to the former model, um, you know, which proposes uh, you know, that the brain creates the impression of that kind of communication taking place. Hmm. So the brain is almost like a receiver. In 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 a sort of way, for God. Well, an ex well, I mean, an extremely you know complex receiver. You know, <laughs> of, of course, complex receiver. I guess I was a little reductive in, there the uh, about the brain. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, because it's uh, well, well, yeah, because it's you know generating the images um, at the same time, uh, you know, that is you know trying to uh, um, interpret them, um, you know. Yeah, you know, but still, um, if you if you can you know take a you know, look at you know the phenomena from the top down, it explains you know why the brain is configured that way, um, and 
it also you know can include you know some larger concepts uh, you know so uh, you know the purely biological model uh, you know suggests you know that the brain is configured that way in order you know uh, you know in order to help uh, you know humans uh, it makes them kinder more compassionate more empathic you know they get along with each other better it's got adaptive value you know um, you know but if you look at a lot of you know the prophetic message it isn't just especially you know feel good especially um, over the short run uh, you know so that could help explain uh, you know why you know some of you know the prophetic spiritual message um, isn't uh, what you might call you know Darwinian uh, in its origins or in its applications uh, it's you know more abstract um, and, and it also you know can allow uh, you know somebody who's got a spiritual you know bent to uh, you know maintain uh, you know to maintain their faith uh, and at uh, the same time um, you know have it strengthened in uh, you know some ways uh, you, you know uh, you know through considering um, well this kind of model um, it also exp well you know as I refer to uh, you know uh, uh, like a minute ago uh, it also helps explain you know why things are configured in this way uh, you know for example it you know, could be the fact or it you know could be the case if you prayed or you meditated or you fasted you know that you would grow an extra nose <laughs> you know, but instead I mean, you have a spiritual experience uh, and you know so it's of interest to you know think about uh, 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 well, uh, well the, you know, the underlying uh, uh, well, the, well the underlying you know reason you know, for, uh, you know, for things, you know, being the way they are, and uh, if you conceptualize it as the brain is configured in you know such a way to communicate with God, uh, you know, quite a few different things you know fall into place. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. What what's the next step for uh, theo neurology? Where do we go from here? Yeah, uh, so that's a important question, and I'm not certain, you know, uh, other than you know suggesting that we talk about it. Um, you know, it's an interesting approach to spirituality, and it also is able to incorporate points of view which aren't, you know, normally, uh, you know, spoken of within the same breath. Um, and I think, you know, it's a good opportunity, you know, for discussions to take place, you know, um, you know, between, uh, you know, the, uh, well, um, well, so between your know, scientists, uh, I mean, you know, theologians, uh, in a you know way, um, which respects uh, you know the, the spiritual or you um, or the religious you know point of view, um, as uh, you know um, stand, standing on uh, the same level, uh, um, as you know the brain, uh, uh, well, uh, um, as the brain you know science point of view. Um, I think usually um, with you know these you know uh, you know kinds of of uh, discussions you know the uh, uh, on the clerics and uh, and uh, and uh, the theologians um, uh, well they don't quite uh, you know take a stand at the beginning or um, I'm, I'm at the head of the table um, they're kind of an afterthought in a lot of ways and you know the hard science. Um, you know, takes, you know, precedence, you know, but if you look at, you know, the medievalists, you know, they, you know, were able, you know, to develop a, you know, metaphysical system, which, you know, seamlessly integrated, you know, both science and religion, and I think it's, it's, you know, the beginning of, of attempting, you know, kind of a, you know, renaissance of, you know, you know, of, I'm a, uh, I'm of you know, medieval metaphysics in a way, um, which uh, um, you know, which I would like to you know see um, start to happen. Yeah, and I think this is really the start uh, of that, and I really appreciate how you're expanding the the religious and scientific conversation at both the same time, and how you're making it inclusive instead of exclusive, essentially, between the two. And uh, before we, we wrap up the show, just share your social media website so people can read your blog and also get info on your public appearances. 
Well, sure. Um, so I just, uh, uh, well, um, well, so the new book came out only about a month ago, and I started, uh, you know, my own Facebook page. Uh, you know, so um, you can keep an eye on, on you know, things um, through Facebook. Um, and uh, and uh, I have a, um, and I have got you know my own website, which is rickstrassman.com, R S C K S D R A S S M A N, and um, I keep current on appearances, uh, speaking engagements, those kinds of things. And also, I've been trying you know to be more current with uh, expressing you know some of my um, ideas and you know some of the controversies um, you know which this book is engendering. Uh, on uh, I'm on my website as well. Uh, you know, so my Facebook and you know my own website are the, um, are the best places to go. Great, and and we'll throw up those quick links on our website for you as well. Big thank you, Rick Strassman, for for such an illuminating experience and and conversation. And I really look forward to the next one. Uh, and thank you so much for for joining us tonight on the Mind's Eye. Okay, Brian. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed our interview. Till next time. Enjoy your night. Okay, bye-bye. And as always, we have quick links to our guest social media site. So check out the mindseyemedia.com for more info on tonight's edition. While you're there, enjoy cherry-picked news articles and videos, the complete set of archives completely free and the upcoming guest schedule, and so much more. All at themindseyemedia.com. And don't forget to check over and roll over to our brand spanking new Facebook page, facebook.com backslash show. Join the Minds Eye again next Tuesday, October 28th, for a late night Halloween special that will scare you to sleep. I'll be hosting a live three hour show starting at 10 p.m. Eastern with a trio of guests to help us cross the veil. In the first hour, Bob Cranmer, former Army Intelligence Officer and County Commissioner, will converse about his experiences living in a haunted house detailed in the Demon of Brownsville Road. Afterwards, afterlife expert Roberta Grimes will discuss what happens when we die and how to communicate with the dead. Featured in her books, The Fun of Staying in Touch, How Our Loved Ones Contact Us, and How We Contact Them. In the final hour, we'll top it off with a special replay of our recent interview with Dr. Supernatural himself, Joshua P. Warren, who will send shivers down your spine by retelling true ghost stories from his latest, It Was a Dark and Creepy Night, Real Life Encounters with the Strange, Mysterious, and Downright Terrifying. And sadly, our time has come to a conclusion Thank you so much for joining me on The Mind's Eye. Until the next one, I'm your host, Brian Turnoff, and this is Z Talk Radio.